Hi guys, uh, my name is Jeff Coronado and I'm a licensed structural engineer at JCSC and this is uh, a tutorial, a structural engineering design tutorial in a series that we entitled Bridging the Gap. Um, and the purpose of these tutorials is to assist uh, young structural engineers um, bridging the gap uh, between the knowledge that maybe they picked up in school uh, or didn't pick up in school um, and what they need to know uh, once they start their 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 young careers so uh, again it's entitled bridging the gap and basically today uh, what we're going to cover is a question that came in um, that basically reads what is the numerical capacity of a flare um, of a flare bevel weld so here we have a detail um, and and uh, if we blow it up a little bit let's see um, really what we're looking at is um, this part right here where we've got a steel plate and we want to weld uh, a steel rebar uh, to that plate. So let's, um, mm -hmm. So let's expand on this elevation uh, of the flare bevel weld. So what we would have is, um, here. Um, if we look at the elevation here, we're gonna we're gonna see that we have. Um, so let's just say we have a steel plate, and let's use another color here. Let's use blue and say that we've got a rebar, and again, this is all in elevation. Um, and we've got a tensile force here that's pulling this apart. And let's use green to show the weld. So we're welding between these two materials to transfer that tensile load. Um, so we've got a, um, what, what we would call an effective length to that weld. Let's call it L sub B. Um, we've got an effective length, which has been covered uh, in, another, in another tutorial. So uh, you can, by all means, send me an email uh, and ask, or you may have already have seen it, uh, but that's covered in another tutorial. So let's see if we can uh, move on here. Um, now we want to look at the connection in section. Okay, so let's look at the connection in section. So what would that look like? Well, uh, again, we're going to have a steel plate. Um, So we have a steel plate. And we have a rebar. So that's a circular to a circular shape. And that's why it's called a flare bevel weld. Um, and in green, let's show our weld here. So we have a weld that basically fills all of this up. Okay, and we're gonna have the same thing over here. Um, now let's talk a little bit about the thickness of the weld because I think that sometimes is a, is a misconception. So let me see, can we, yeah, you know what, why don't we try to see if, um, if we even expand on that. So here's our base metal or one of our two base metals, the one for the steel plate. And here is the bar, the rebar, All right? So our weld is basically gonna take some kind of shape like this. And this will get all filled up with weld. All right, so if I, if I pull that out, and I just look at the weld, it looks like I'm gonna have a shape 
that's kind of like this, right? So what is our effective thickness here? Um, well, it is not going to be, it is not going to be this length here. It should, it's not going to be this length here. Put an X through those. Um, it should be, can I do that? Yeah. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. So let me. So we've got this. It should be some length that cuts across through the thickness of the weld that represents the shortest dimension of the weld. Um, but in this case, we've got this odd shape, and that's why uh, we're, we're, we're not able to take this full length across here, because at some point, some of this, some of this area, we just consider to be basically gibberish, right? It's, it's, it's not, uh, we're not going to rely on this uh, kind of this little area here to transfer the force that we, that we need transferred. So we're given a certain, um, uh, they, a certain value that we can take for this effective thickness. Uh, and again, that's covered in another one of our tutorials in Bridging the Gap. But, um, but basically, this is what represents, this is the effective thickness. It is intended to be the shortest thickness uh, of the weld that we can rely on to transfer force. Um, it is not intended to be, uh, again, the surface uh, uh, between the weld and one of the materials, either, either in this case, the steel plate, or in this case, the, the rebar. It's not intended to be uh, the contact surface. That's not what we refer to as far as the effective thickness. Okay, moving on. What do we have here? All right, so now let's move on to determining the, uh, the available strength of the weld. And we have two methods that we can follow. Uh, we can either uh, determine the weld based on LRFD procedures, okay? So we can either do the design strength, determine the design strength of the weld, or we can uh, determine the allowable strength of the weld. Uh, and that's following an ASD procedure. And that's what we're gonna show in this tutorial. We're gonna do an ASD procedure. Uh, let me scroll this up, okay. So with that, um, let's move on to trying to determine uh, our uh, shear capacity for the weld. Um, now, notice how I've written this out in lowercase, meaning it is a shear stress. It is a, a stress capacity. It's not the full capacity of the weld connection. We first wanna determine just the stress capacity. All right, so we're gonna call that lowercase v, and our, our lower, uh, lowercase v capacity is equal to this expression in which we have F sub W. Well, F sub W is uh, the weld metal nominal strength. Okay, weld metal nominal strength. So it's the capacity, uh, th this, this captures the capacity of the weld metal. Uh, we're not looking at the base metals. Remember, that's, that's another, another tutorial, how to determine the capacity of either the steel base plate, uh, the steel plate intention, or determining the capacity of the rebar intention. Right here, what we're determining is the capacity of the weld. So we have F sub W, and, um, and, and, and here is the expression that gives us the capacity for F sub W. So F sub W is 60% of Fe, uh, F, E, X, X, okay? 
Um, and if you don't believe me, um, if you don't believe me, go, mm, you know, that, that's fine. Um, you can check that up in, uh, uh, that's given in AISC 360, table J2.5. And there you'll find the weld capacity. So we have 60% of FEX, -E all right? Um, let's scroll down. And okay, let's see, what's FEXX? -X? Well, it's the electrode strength. All right, well, how do, how do, how do I figure out what the electro, electrode strength is? Well, that's going to vary uh, from office to office. So that you need to take a look at your general notes in your office. At JCSE, what we use uh, typically is, and, and I've taken an excerpt of, uh, of our general notes, it says welding electrodes shall be low hydrogen E70XX. Um, the 70 is a reference to the strength of the weld material. So it refers to 70 KSI. Hence, we get the, uh, here we get the FE, FEXX equals 70 KSI. Um, 60 KSI electrodes also pretty, pretty frequently used, um, but I, I gotta believe that the standard of the industry is, is more like 70 KSI. So, and, and again, that's per your general notes, you just have to make sure that the, what you're calculating it matches what you're specifying in your general notes. So we use 70 KSI. So again, remember, FW was 60% of that. So what we get is 42 KSI for FW. Let's see now if we scroll down from there. Okay, you know what? I think it's gonna be easier if I pick this up. All right, so the, let me scroll back up. So we've now figured out, um, we've now figured out the F sub W, right? Now we've got this omega factor, all right? Let's go pick up omega. What do we have here? So omega, is equal to 2.0. It's our safety factor. Uh, and again, that's given in um, ASC 360, table J2.5. So now with that, we can determine what our shear, um, our unit, our, our shear stress capacity, if you will, our shear stress capacity, our lowercase v, uh, is equal to 42 uh, KSI, divided by our safety factor of two. And so that gives us 21 KSI. That's kind of the takeaway value. So it's 21 KSI. Um, now trying to put it together, uh, what we end up with is now notice how I'm switching from lowercase v to uppercase v because now I am going to look at the full capacity of the weld. Now I can think of the full capacity of the weld as my unit uh, shear stress, which is 21 KSI times the effective length times the effective thickness of the weld. Again, the effective length was covered in another tutorial and the effective thickness was covered in another tutorial. Um, uh, and then you multiply those two values by 21 KSI, and that's the full capacity of the weld. So here, now you can, it just becomes an algebra thing, right? You can, you can play with these values. For instance, if, you, if you're an analyzing a weld, it's already there. You know the effective length, you know the effective thickness, you multiply it by the 21 KSI, and there's the capacity of that weld. Um, it, you might be designing but you might just um, kind of be checking uh, a design. So you're already um, guessing at what you believe is a reasonable length and a reasonable effective thickness. Um, and then you can just check your, your capacity of the weld based on that to determine and make sure that it's greater than the demand that you have. Um, or you might uh, have a, a, an idea of what the length is um, but you're not sure what effective thickness, uh, what minimum effective thickness you need. Okay, so you'll solve for T effective, right? 
So then V, uh, T effective becomes V divided by 21 L. Um, or you might have a thickness in mind, uh, but you just don't know how much length you need. Okay, so then you solve for L. All right, so that's basically the way to determine the uh, flare bevel groove uh, weld capacity. If you have any questions on this or, or in anything that I've covered here, by all means, feel free to send me an email. Uh, you can see my email address there at the bottom uh, of the screen. Okay, real good.